and we're live. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of HR Leaders Live. I'm Chris Rainey, co-founder here at HR Leaders and I'll be your host as always. And I'm joined by my partner in crime as always, Matt Burns. Matt is a former CHRO, host of the Thinking Inside the Box podcast and now one of HR Leaders industry analysts. Uh, I, don't know, I don't even know what that means yet, Matt. So maybe you have to fill me in. Uh, what does that even mean? What, what do you do now? At HR leaders well, well, apparently it means we it means we have the same dress code today. So that's what it means, I think, to start with. <laughs> the first time in four years we've put on shows together, it's the first time we've actually looked alike. So I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm kind of missing the beard, um, though, Matt. I'm kind of not really there yet with the beard. Dude. Come on, give me a while. You'll, you'll, get, you'll, you'll get there. You'll get there. <laughs> yeah. I think it means, Chris, bringing our audience just insights from around the globe of what's happening in the HR industry more broadly, whether it's trends, technology, future of work, just bringing them more and more insights going forward. Amazing. So it really just formalizes the work we're doing already. It's great. At least one of us knows what we're talking about. And on that point, we had to bring in some more knowledge today. We're, we're joined by our good friend, Trapper Yates, who's the vice president of Global Conversation at HP. How are you doing? It's been a while since we last spoke. It has been a little while. Yeah, doing well. Enjoying uh, uh, the role, enjoying the fact that summer in the Northern Hemisphere is, is here. So life is good amazing and congratulations again to you and the family on the fifth edition to the family thank you yeah. we're gonna have to do we've another our... yeah we have to do another show about how that works and how do you do that because <laughs> I, I said i said to you backstage i'm barely dealing with myself and one child let alone five so that, that's uh we need some advice and guidance yeah definitely a team effort um heavily leaning on the other half of the team for that for sure yeah yeah i feel like you probably think that you've got the easy job <laughs> so. a lot of days i do think that's the case for sure yeah. no no i love it well look super excited for today's episode um before we jump in matt could you give us kind of a bit of a background people probably looking at the title being like oh interesting uh probably hit on a few nerves maybe what why we why did we decide to, go, to discuss this topic today matt that's this call throwing your co under the bus on live program. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, one of us is going to have to take it. I don't, I've always enjoyed generational conversations. I mean, I was an older millennial in the workplace, and most of my coaches were baby boomers when I first started out in HR. Yeah. And I remember having the conversations about, should we use technology in HR or is that inhuman? And now we flash forward 20 years later and go, how could we not use techn technology to move our agenda forward? I think what I'm seeing now is we're into a new era of the profession where most of our millennial colleagues, Gen Xers, They've now all assumed leadership roles. And now we're supporting the next generation in the workforce coming in, and that's Gen Z and Gen Alpha. And they have unique challenges and unique opportunities just like we did when we entered the workforce. And mm -hmm. whether it's you know the fact that they're digital natives and we weren't, the fact that they went through a two-year pandemic during formative years of their own lives as young adults and you know teenagers, it creates some real challenges for organizations. So admittedly, a little bit clickbaity for the title, but I'm looking forward to a robust conversation about the challenges this generation faces and how organizations and their leaders can respond to meet them. Yeah, and I think this was inspired. Both me and you came across the CNBC article talking about this, you know, companies are learning that Gen Z is an easiest generation at work. We'll link that link to that article in, in, in the comments for you. Um, as well, just so you can see some context there. Uh, Trapper, what, what are you seeing? Obviously, you're looking at it from you, you look at it from a very unique lens. Um, I'd love to mm -hmm. hear what you're you're seeing, and you've been you've been doing this for a long while. What are your thoughts and perspectives? Yeah, you know, I like what Matt said I, when he mentioned you know considered kind of an old millennial, same boat for myself. And I remember being in the workforce, um, especially early on, and there was all this talk about millennials, or and they started to throw out labels, you know, like lazy, yeah. entitled, whatever. And, you know, I, I do think that there are some, certainly some trends in, in each generation. And Matt laid out a couple of those um, digital natives with Gen Z, um, as well as, you know, going through a pandemic and kind of early in their, their career. Those are two big things. But I also like to look and build on the commonalities. And I think that there's there can be as much difference between older portions of a generation and younger portions of a generation as there are between generations. And I also think there's things like people want to be treated uh, fairly with respect. They want to be valued for their contributions. And I think there's some ways that, you know, certainly we need to leverage the the skills and things that they bring in as digital natives and, and what they can teach us. But we also can build on, on those areas of common interest and understand that 
people are today uh, the same in in a lot of ways similar to people uh, in generations prior, and they want that same respect and things. So I, I think that's important to keep in mind when we go through this. A hundred percent. You mentioned there that they are digital natives. We can all attest to that. I think that's no one's arguing that fact. Matt, what do you see as the areas perhaps that they that they're less that <laughs> uh, they come less natural uh, to, to to them? You know, this is where I get sensitive to Trapper's point. Like, it's all about context. Like, we talk about context. Our context is, I grew up in a childhood where playing looked like hopping on my bike and riding around the neighborhood with the kids. And I didn't have a device in my hand until I was in college. So for me, the internet was a thing, but it was very much a background noise through high school and then into college and then, of course, into adulthood. Yeah. I still remember getting my first BlackBerry in my early 20s at work oh, and going, Blackberry. oh my God, this, this is amazing. I have access to my emails at home. And then realizing two days later... Oh crap! I have access to my emails at home. Like so, <laughs> I, that's my my context is that social interactions throughout my childhood were face to face. When you wanted to meet the kids in the neighborhood, you went down, you grabbed your bikes, you played around, you had conversations, you went to the school, you threw the ball around. Like that was socializing. This generation socializing is you hop on your phone and you communicate with people all around the world. And the interface is a screen. It isn't face-to-face -face in a lot of cases. Now, of course, there's it's not binary, but mm -hmm. there's much more of a digital interface with those communications. So where they may struggle is in those traditional face-to-face -face conversations. When we bring people back into an office environment and they have those proverbial water cooler chats or those career succession planning conversations that require that face-to-face -face chat with their colleagues and their peers, they may not have the experience in having those chats to the same degree or intimacy as we did growing up. But by extension, and Trapper mentioned this, we're probably less comfortable with some of the digital tools that they're yeah. using in terms of how they work. So it's it's not so much where they're lacking, it's more you know where they have opportunities and where we have opportunities. And to Trapper's point, how do we blend them together to find that symbiosis of both? Yeah, so some of those softer skills then that we naturally developed yeah. as uh, growing up, those communication skills, the relationship building, it was done in person um influence then. persuasion influence, persuasion um i always find it fascinating because uh, my my one of my nephews is 10 years old and we, we were out one day and i just struck up a conversation with a stranger and he looked at me like i was doing something crazy because in his you know he, he's, con he's he's communicating through a digital environment and he's never seen someone just spark a conversation with someone in person and actually he's like do, do, do you know do you know them i was like no he's like what how like he's so confused <laughs> that I just started a conversation and I was like no I just said hi and we you know how are you and we struck a conversation you know oh I'm traveling here from Canada great what brings you here and he just looked at me like it was like seeing an alien um, um that as well so I realized oh that's completely different the way that they build relationships the way they communicate and we have to shift as as leaders as businesses as HR <laughs> in terms of the way we communicate with this new generation um now as well like the idea of picking up the phone and calling them they find quite strange i've had some people join us recently that when i call them they think something's got like a disaster's happened because why would i why would i possibly be calling them on the phone <laughs> uh, as well and i'm like no just checking in see how, how you are they're like uh okay that's what it was for <laughs> yeah. at first we used to, that was what the phone was <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you know i would i would say the art of short form communication yeah. and in fact extreme short form communication. I mean, if you're going to respond to somebody in the affirmative through a text message, it's literally the letter K, right? Or throwing a thumbs up on their on their uh, uh, their response. And so Gen Z is is getting to the point that uh, one of the challenges is that longer form communication and those communications that need to be maybe a little bit more formal. Um, and I know we'll probably hit on it, but things like chat GPT are just game changing on the ways that uh that young people can take that really extreme short form communication mm -hmm. and leverage technology to actually um make their lives easier when they're doing that long form communication yeah we had a um a round table yesterday where, where we had a group of chros from actually all different parts of the world and uh badia um Robolido, who's the chief hr officer of crispy cream was on the show and she was talking about for the new hires that she's bringing in the onboarding process is like a series of TikToks. So they yeah. <laughs> so they have it literally 10 seconds, 20 second bites. And they've seen like the engagement go up and like the, 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 the sort of the knowledge exchange happening, whereas they had this really long but laborious process before with like 10, 20 minute videos, uh, you jump four Zoom calls, 
you, you name it. And they're like, they don't need that. They just want that short, straight to the point, TikTok style <laughs> uh, co content. And they're, they're like, it's been a game changer. And now when they're kind of rolling out some of their digital transformation pieces or even the, the sort of cultural transformation pieces, they're making TikTok content to engage mm -hmm. that, that segment of their, of, of their population. And it's been a game changer. And even people are talking about it in the company, oh, did you see that TikTok? Yeah. And they're sharing it inside of the social apps and Slack and stuff like that. So it's very, yeah. so different yeah, we, <laughs> to our we, generation. We actually did something similar. We do a, you know, in our focal cycle, we do some training with managers on how to have the right conversations with your employees around pay and performance mm -hmm. and those types of things. We've always tried to kind of mix up the style of that. And uh, last, last year in our last cycle, we really turned it into what we call the watch party. And so we created these kind of short, they weren't as short as TikToks. And certainly I think we can move to kind of shorter even, but just modules on like videos about communicating compensation and, and talking about our bonus programs and things like that. And then it was really a, a hosted watch party, if you will, of, hey, let's watch this trailer for this uh, this part of, of our training. Um, and we had some creative people and doing some, we acquired Poly last year. And so they had this screen look like a screen streaming service and one of the titles was along came poly um you know for our poly nice. acquisition and we kind of highlighted some of the neat things we did through the year but that changing the way we train to your point is one of the ways that we're going to access this generation um a little bit better also for people listening in you know, HLE, it doesn't have to be super polished i think one of the mistakes that companies make is they they make this fancy kind of you know overly produced video and content sometimes it can be as simple as one of your leaders holding up a phone and just filming themselves like a TikTok, literally in a very authentic way and people are going to engage with that so much more because that's what they used to whereas if we have this really highly produced video production people kind of disengage that oh here's another policy <laughs> that i have to that i have to view so it's also make sure you produce the con content in a way that's consumable and feels authentic um which can be which can be really hard i would say for other generations myself it's included, true, yeah. it's hard to put something out there that you feel like is not a you know a polished version of something and so uh, i think it's a great point for sure chris yeah difficult to do especially no, for people good that... point though like i do it every day <laughs> so i get is i i get it but like even when i have people come into studio to film content that aren't haven't been in the com in front of a camera before i forget that and i go oh this is not normal for most people <laughs> to look down a camera lens and have a conversation because um, you're, you're very vulnerable, right? You, you know, you're putting yourself yeah. out there. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of, it's, it can be scary. Um, so what does this mean for HR, Matt, then, in terms of the way we, in terms of the practices and processes, you know, you've, you've led teams in very large multinational companies. How, looking back now, how, how is it, would that change the approach that you would have taken? At the risk of replicating the old man screams at cloud meme, I, I I think about like where we are now, and Chris is wondering what I'm talking about. So Chris, it's a I have no idea what your fist at the cloud. I have no idea what that, okay. I was. I nodded, pretending that I knew what that meant, but no. <laughs> well, I'll send you the meme separately. But oh. essentially, it's <laughs> okay. older generations lamenting the fact that new generations don't do things the way they used to do them. Oh, okay, <laughs> and in in that sense, um, it's from the Simpsons, Chris. So it's a Gen X thing. Um, oh. from, so from that context, it's about thinking about how we do things differently. And I think to Trapper's conversation, it's about meeting the employees where they're at and understanding that today, HR employees and HR leaders are much more like marketers than we ever have been before. I mean, traditionally, when we were started in HR, it was communication looked like bulletin boards, it looked like company newsletters, and it was push. It was a broadcast. It was push it down and we expect you read it, we expect you ingest it, and we expect you take actions against it. That doesn't cut it anymore. We now have to meet employees like a marketer would meet their audience mm. using multiple mediums, different forms of communication. And what you talked about, Chris, with Krispy Kreme is a great point. They're using TikTok videos, but they're also creating long form content for their millennial and Gen X and boomer population as well. You're creating multiple different types of content to be able to meet people where they're at. Because ultimately, if you create one singular type of content, you're not being very inclusionary. And we're now in an era of being inclusionary across our entire businesses. Yeah. So HR has to think about this in a context of, 
you know, again, I'm talking about generational differences, even though I may lament the fact that we're moving to shorter form content and you might lose something in translation. Ultimately, if the audience that appreciates short form content doesn't engage in the long form pieces, I'm not doing my job as an HR leader and helping meet them where they're at. And I'm not going to get the desired engagement, performance, and retention that I need to help move the company's agenda forward. So I think it's a big shift for us as HR leaders going forward to think about it in those terms, to think about it in a marketing lens, but it's absolutely essential in 2023. Mm. Remember, Matt, how many years ago was it we spoke about the intersection of HR and marketing? Remember when we first started speaking mm -hmm. like three years ago? Four, four, four years ago? <laughs> yeah, four years ago. Now it's really, you know, like it was even then it was really important, but now we're seeing it, even the type of skills that, that exist within a HR team has needed to evolve. You know, I actually know CHROs that have videographers that work within their team now, full time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As part, to literally every day they're creating content, working with the HR, that, that doesn't exist. That was not a role that existed in the past. And uh, a lot of the leaders, to, to, to um, Trapper's point of view, I spoke to a CTO yesterday from a very large multinational company. I can't mention their name until we get the sign off from legal and comms. <laughs> um, but they said to me, only this year was the first time they're allowed to speak publicly. In the past, their leaders weren't even allowed to put content on LinkedIn and to, and mm. to put themselves out there because it was such a you know, culturally, it was so far, far away. Whereas now they're realizing that if we're not out there, we're not engaging, we're not, we're not, in, we're not, we're not digital. They don't exist, and they're struggling to attract employees right now. What a surprise! <laughs> if you're not, if you can't even engage in in the space that they exist, how do you expect? And they're like, Chris, I'm really happy that I can finally come on your podcast and talk about some of the great things we're doing because for years we weren't allowed to do that, and it's just like, wow, there are still a lot of companies that are in that space. Even even in this day and age, um, as well. I think it's because they look at the risk, you know, brand and reputational yes. risk. If yeah. Somebody says something that is is against it, and um, and there is a risk there for sure. Uh, but also, to your point, it's almost like evolve and move forward. You know, you have to adapt to to those types of things and put put principles in place. But um, but I think the risk of not engaging in those ways is potentially higher no it is that's and, i was about to say that right you have to you have to flip the the, the narrative what is the cost of not doing it sure. <laughs> like, you know what is the cost of not and also are you really going to punish the entire organization for the faults of maybe one person saying something out of line mm -hmm. like, is that really is that really is that really what you want to do you know we've seen that with policies in the past you, know, you want to punish the many because one person may take advantage of it um as well we need to show trust and uh, if you've hired those leaders into those positions, you would, you'd hopefully trust them. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna, they're, they're gonna create great content. Um, how, how have you seen this shape the conversations that you're having, Trapper, from a compensation and benefits perspective? Um, in a few ways. I think, you know, first of all, I'll go back to like finding those areas of common ground, because I do feel like when you when you think about compensation, first and foremost, to me, it's ensuring that compensation isn't a stumbling block in the conversation with employees. You know, if they, if they feel fairly paid, if they feel that they understand their pay and the reason they're paid the way that they are, uh, people are going to be handled that much better than if it's just a big black box. So I think transparency is becoming more important. There's a lot, a lot of legislation around that that's, uh, that's pushing it that way. And companies are making choices on, you know, going just by the legislation or kind of going, uh, getting out ahead of that. And uh, those are important choice points. And when I think about it in terms of, you know, the benefit offerings to employees, they value different things than previous generations uh, may have valued. And so I think understanding, you know, shortening the feedback loops, hearing from them what they, what they value, and then uh, responding to that are some of the best things we can do. Years ago, we started a student debt repayment assistance program. And now that seems like, well, I think almost every big yeah. company has some form. Um, at the time, I don't, we weren't the first, but we were earlier on that because we knew millennials had crushing student debt and it was really uh, something that could help them. And so there's going to be new and different things. Uh, I don't know necessarily what those are today, but listening and reacting uh, in quicker ways, I think is important. 
It's so interesting. It, it, Trapper, I'm really interested in your thoughts on, sorry, Chris, but okay. I'm interested in your thoughts on the intersection of remote work and hybrid work going forward. Mm -hmm. So I think going into the pandemic, most of us would have had the assumption that younger generations prefer more of a digital interface. They're more open to remote work. We found out through the pandemic that actually in a lot of cases, Gen Z in particular, felt the loss of social connection in the workplace and wanted to come back into offices. We're now in this post-pandemic landscape. You're sitting in a global role in an organization that is foundations are in technology. What are your thoughts on remote work and how it fits into either the generational differences or just more broadly compensation? Like how are you approaching that tough conversation knowing that you have regional differences, generational differences, and all the other macroeconomic challenges that you're facing as well? Uh, yeah, so much to unpack in the, <laughs> That's a big the question. <laughs> for sure. Um, you know, I think about it in a few ways. One, you mentioned global company. I mean, nobody on my direct team actually sits in the same location. And part of that, it's it's by design. You we have we are a global company, and so we need individuals in these different time zones and locations to be able to manage just in time issues that come up. But that makes it more of a challenge sometimes to say what's the value in going into an office you know nobody on my direct team is there but there are there are tangential opportunities i, I believe in the office um, those water cooler chats i think the mentoring opportunities for younger employees it's harder to do those yeah. in in an environment that's purely virtual and so we're huge on hybrid work i mean big part of our portfolio is in supporting hybrid work and um but what is hybrid work and who it, it's not necessarily five days from home or remote. Um, it's not necessarily X days in an office either. So I think it depends on the individual and, uh, and their circumstances and the role that they're in. But the important thing, the important thing to know or to remember is it's also going to be different what people want. You mentioned, you know, for some during the pandemic, especially it was really tough for those people never to have, well, they're probably a big part of their social network uh, is in their work environment. And so they want that interaction. They want those opportunities. Whereas someone uh, like myself with, uh, with a family and different things, if I can cut that time out of my commute and I'm having conversations globally anyway, where if I went in an office, I'd be on a, a Zoom call most likely for a good chunk of the day. Um, a lot of times that's preferred in home at, at my you know home office. So I think it depends on the role, but I also think we have to realize that even if it, my job is easier uh, from a remote or home office, sometimes there are valuable touch points and intersections to be in person. And um, it's going to be a balance and it's going to be there, a lot of companies are are spending a lot of time figuring this out. I do think it's bad to say X days in X location because a, a, a sweeping mandate like that isn't necessarily the best for the employee or or the role. Um, so there, there's that's part of part of the thinking around that. Yeah, I think it's an interesting conversation because you're right. When we get prescriptive, we then again are being exclusionary because you've referenced the global nuances the role nuances, the generational nuances, it's also lifestyle nuances as well. I mean, you mentioned being a family, we live in multi-generational households, affordability is an issue in North America and Western Europe around housing. Like there's a lot of other complexities that didn't exist 20 years ago in the workplace that now are coming into the fore. And we're, we're asking employees to be more flexible and more available than ever before. I think the balance to that is being more agile in how we look at work so that they can integrate it more effectively within their lives. I know there's sensitivities and there's nervousness around productivity when you allow for that. But to me, that's more of a conversation around effective performance management. Like if you're concerned about people's productivity while they're not in the office, then improve your performance management mandates. And then Absolutely. you don't have that problem anymore. Um, otherwise, to me, it reeks of a lack of distrust. And that to me is a culture that I'm a little bit suspicious about. And I agree with what you're saying. There's clearly a mandate for coming to the office for social connection. I know Chris's team, they meet on a frequent basis to come together, collaborate. It's a creative organization. That makes sense as mm -hmm. it does to provide that team of flexibility so that they can manage their other obligations. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And and you collaborate and celebrate. I know, Chris, you've talked about that before as well, that those are opportunities to come together and celebrate. And that's really best done in person. 
also measuring outcomes is absolutely critical. I mean, you're not measuring time that somebody's in X seat or, yes. or that you're actually viewing them. It's really what's the output, what's the outcome I want and being able to measure that. One other thing you, you touched on um, in your initial question on, around compensation and kind of what's what are the big things there? I mean, one of the huge things that uh, compensation professionals are figuring out right now is uh, this thing around geographic differentials. I mean, you've got different, very different cost of labor mm. in a place like San Francisco versus, you know, we talk, joke around about the cornfield in Iowa, but you could have a software developer in either of those locations being equally as productive or perhaps even more so in the uh, cornfield in Iowa, if you will. And do you pay those people the same? Some companies have taken an approach where they say, look, we're doing away with geographic differentials. Most companies are still in a situation in the United States, as an example, where most companies have like three to five geo differentials um, to, to really show the cost of true cost of labor in those locations. I think in my mind, the trend that is certainly going to continue to be a topic, but it's more around, there's a huge opportunity to identify and manage performance and and talent mobility and even compensation on skills. So understanding the level of uh, the skills that an individual has and the proficiency of those skills, ultimately, if you get a lot of those things right, you can say you're going to pay based on those skills, not necessarily X role in Y location or, or however you may, you may look at it today. Uh, I think that's definitely where we're going. Our entire panel yesterday I mentioned was all around skills. <laughs> and uh, many yeah. of the H of the HR leaders brought up the same thing. They're working towards exactly what you just described, where we're paying for skills as opposed to you're based here, you're based there, etc. And also, it gets really complicated and messy um, <laughs> when you do it that way. And to your point about transparency, it kind of encourages the opposite <laughs> of, yeah. of transparency because you don't want to upset people, etc. Uh, whereas if you if you do that and you map it back to skills, you can be transparent because it's the same. It's equal. It's inclusive um, yep. across across. Well, and you're in, and you're incentivizing the right kinds of behaviors. Like I, I live in a world where incentives drive activity and, and drive action. And if you're incentivizing where people live, that's a different conversation than the skills that you have. And we're in an yeah. era right now where we're going through massive disruption. And let's be honest, it's tools like AI and XR are disrupting a lot of traditional industries. And we need employees and organizations to upgrade their skills in a very short period of time. The best way to incentivize that is to compensate for skills. So people have the opportunity to collect and aggregate additional skills, knowing they're going to be rewarded for that, both in terms of job opportunities and the salary within those jobs. So I think to me, as I think about the opportunity and a trapper hit on it, you, you need to move towards that skills-based compensation approach if you're going to try and incentivize employees to really take on that responsibility themselves. Otherwise, you're asking the organizations to bear the brunt of that skills reskilling re effort. And that's a dangerous place to be in an era where organizations are increasingly making tough decisions on a short-term basis versus a longer term view would that would that might also have quite a big impact on sort of the gender pay gap um as well if we if we do that T tough question i don't think i don't think gender should come into play when it talks about skills i know it, I should, I know it, it shouldn't i know it shouldn't but i mean would that close help us close the gap i'm thinking if we if we map it that way where it's based on skills and it it's very de clearly defined it it should. Here's the here's the caveat, though, and I'm certainly not an expert in diversity and inclusion. We should bring an expert on to have this exact conversation, maybe bring Trapper back for it. But <laughs> my understanding is that for women in the workplace, because of the load that they carry outside of the workplace, they may not have the same flexibility and adaptability oh, okay. to acquire some of those skills. Because if you are caring for a family, for example, you may not have time to do an MBA on the side, whereas mm. in a traditional household, the other partner might. And I'm just presenting a very sure. templated sure, sure, blanket sure, example. Sure. In those cases, gender is a disadvantage. So I think we have to be thoughtful about how we create incentives and design around this in a future. I don't think, as we all don't think, that gender should be a determining factor around 100%. compensation or skills or opportunity, but there are still some structural and societal yeah. constructs that unfortunately skew things one way or the other. I think it's incumbent upon organizations to be thoughtful around that to create opportunities where that becomes less and less of a consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, one of the things that we've been seeing as well, Trapper, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is is, is this generation's really focused on the why, you know, and mm. connecting their values and their purpose and mission. I don't know. I feel like in my generation, I don't even remember one single person ever even bringing it up. 
<laughs> maybe yeah. it's just the people I worked with. And it wasn't, it was only maybe like five, six years into my career where I was like, why do I do this? <laughs> How does this align? But it took a long time. Whereas now when I'm interviewing, I'm interviewing you know, every week for different roles. It's coming up immediately. It's like yeah. before we even speak about salary and compensation, it's why purpose values are we aligned? Are you seeing yeah, that? And I think you're not, you're, you're seeing the same thing? For sure. And, and I think a big part of it is um, that's the, the generation growing up right now. Um, I think it used to be, if we go back maybe two generations, it was you go to school, you get a good job, you work hard, you put your head down and you, you know, climb the corporate ladder. And certainly I think the conversation has shifted and in some ways in a very healthy way to say, do what you want to do, work for a company that, that you feel passionate about and that you believe in their purpose. So ESG type of uh, initiatives are huge. I, once again, I hate to paint with broad strokes across an entire generation, but mm -hmm. there's certainly more of a of a lens to that with this generation and certainly more uh, activism around that as well. And so I think, you know, things that that we've that we've done for years that we obviously are continuing to do is, is the employee resource groups, or we call them business impact networks around um, causes that people care about. We have next gen, you know, for young employees, we have the pride network, we have um, groups around fitness and we do, we try to bring opportunities for employees to gather um, and move and work toward causes that they care about. Um, volunteering is a big thing. We do initiatives on 40 days of, of volunteering and, and pushing, you know, to say, go out and do good in your community. And um, what we see, you know, certainly through listening is that we're, we're hearing employees look at these things very positively. They value not just that HP provides a paycheck and a steady you know, career growth opportunities, but that HP cares about the things that they care about. So I do see it as being, um, a, I wouldn't even say a, a differentiator. It's sort of, it's becoming really uh, table stakes. You know, yeah. you have to be, uh, have to be considering those things to be a, an employer of choice amongst, I believe this, this current generation for sure. Yeah, I love it. Like, uh, this is really random, but um, my, Bobby been starting uh, school for the first time in in September, so we've been visiting schools. And one of the things that blew me away is every school we went to had a purpose statement and a why and their mission and values on the wall. And 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 this is crazy. There's a kid that was showing us around, so they gave the the, the kid the students gave you a tour. So you got this, you know, six year old kid mm -hmm. taking you around, and they knew every single one of them knew all of the values. I was just awesome. blown away and they, there was this sort of connective that I was just like, this is incredible <laughs> to see it being yeah. nurtured at that young age um, as well. So it's just random to throw that in there. It just really took me back. Uh, like there's many businesses that can learn a lot from these kids <laughs> that, yeah. that are here right now <laughs> as well. It, it, here's what I think they can learn. It's not the putting it on the wall that matters. You know, like culture isn't a statement you write on a wall. It's the fact that they that the the six year olds taking you around for the tour knew and had internalized those yes. values. And I think as a company, if you want to get your culture right, it's not putting up mission statements on a wall. That's a okay, that's a great start for sure. But how do you get your employees to internalize that and, and move mm -hmm. it forward and actually care and be passionate about it? So whatever they were doing at that school certainly is is a good thing and, and they've done it right. Yeah. which I think is a, is a lesson. Amazing. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, nice to see you again, Rep Trapper. Um, let's not wait another yeah. year. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, again. It's good to see you. And um, yeah, um, I don't know if you posted any pictures. I don't know if you've done any of, of the kids and stuff like that, but uh, congratulations again. And you, you've got, you, soon you'll have a football team because I know you're a soccer coach. <laughs> is, that, is, that what, is that what you're working towards? I know you play soccer. So you uh, slowly... I, I, I don't think we'll make it. Uh, <laughs> a roster of five for basketball. Uh, oh, okay. We're not the right genetics to play basketball but okay we've got the right size roster nice all right nope. hockey <laughs> hockey hockey lineup too <laughs> yeah it's very hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like my teeth too much to play hockey right oh <laughs> tell me about it growing up yeah let's not do that let's not talk about that um for everyone listening thanks for joining again as always please like comment subscribe share depending on what platform you're on if you're on linkedin make sure you go follow matt follow trapper there's links there as well and um if you if you haven't already done so make sure you hit the bell notification there's a little icon on linkedin on our profiles it's new if you hit that you'll be notified next time we go live apart from that enjoy your weekend everyone and we'll see you again next week bye everyone see you later